on the 10 new insights in climate science for our 2021 edition. My name's Wendy Broadgate. I'm the Global Hub Director of Future Earth, based at our Global Hub in Stockholm, Sweden. We're a global research network on sustainability science. This report was produced by Future Earth in collaboration with Earth League and the World Climate Research Program. I'll be your host for today, and I'll moderate this session. We're really happy that you've joined us today to hear from the report's authors. We have three of the report's authors online. We have um, one of the editorial board members, um, Johan Rockström, here in the, uh, on stage. The, the 10 New Insights in Climate Science series aims to synthesize the very latest climate research at the international, for the international science policy community. The report is written by 54 expert authors from 20 countries. We've delivered this report annually at the COP since 2017. COP26 is a pivotal moment. Expectations for the Glasgow COP are high. We're rapidly running out of time to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. We hope that the work presented in this report will drive the deep transformations we desperately need. We're reassured that this COP has started with pledges on methane emissions and deforestation and urge for further ambition in line with science. Before we start, I'd like to thank the many report authors and contributors who came from across um, diverse science networks from all over the world. We're delighted to have online three of those authors to answer your questions. So the plan for this press conference is on the screen now. After some welcoming remarks um, by Patricia, if um, Patricia Espinosa, um, or before, um, we may have a, a, an address by Johan Rockström first. Um, we're expecting from Mrs. Patricia Espinosa to join us. Um, Professor Rockström will give a brief presentation of the report. And then we will invite questions from the floor, which will be answered by Professor Rockstrom and the three expert authors that we have online. Uh, we hope to be able to have uh, at least 15 minutes for questions, and we'll answer as many as we can uh, during the time we have together. So I'd like to turn the floor to Professor Johan Rockstrom to give an overview of the report. Professor Rockstrom is director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. He represents both Future Earth and Earth League. Over to you, Johan. Thanks, uh, Wendy, and good morning, everyone. So just, just to set the report again in stage, I mean, the, the purpose of this is from the scientific community to hand over the 10 new insights that we believe every climate negotiator must have in his or her back pocket to be an effective negotiator at any COP meeting and certainly here in Glasgow. So this is the, the scan of the latest insights. Insight number one is that from an Earth system science perspective, we land in the conclusion that 1.5 degrees Celsius is still a possible landing zone. We can still achieve it. The question is, how will we do that from a feasibility perspective? And that an overshoot is likely. It translates to a two gigaton, two billion tons of carbon dioxide per year reduction pace in a linear level, that's 5% per year. But if you want to have a two thirds chance of success, it requires a doubling to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year, and we emit today 42 gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. I think I'll run through the report, Patricia, if that's okay, and then should we do it that way? Yeah. Okay, so insight number so here you have the pathways in the report in terms of the landing zone to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Insight number two is what has been very much in discussion here in Glasgow, namely that there is no safe landing to deliver the Paris Agreement only by decarbonizing the global energy system of carbon dioxide. Methane, nitrous oxide, the non-CO2 gases are worsening global warming. The climate models show clearly that we need to follow the same pace of reductions as carbon dioxide to have a chance of delivering the Paris Agreement. Here you see the latest assessments of the warming versus cooling, cooling gases 
and that nitrous oxide and methane are fundamental here, and that the discussions here and agreements is one step along the way, but not sufficient scientifically. Also important in this context is to remind ourselves that air pollutants are actually cooling the planet. So we have a paradox and a very dramatic one, which is that one environmental problem, air pollutants, are camouflaging another environmental crisis, the global warming crisis. And this is well established scientifically. Insight three is that we've entered the age of intensified mega fires. This is also causing, apart from social impacts on humans, enhanced climate positive feedbacks, which is a warming amplifier. And here you have the 2019-2020 mapping of the accelerated forest fire outbreaks, which are now covering more and more area and caused by human global warming or, or, or accentuated by human global warming. Tipping elements are real. It's a real risk that we cannot rule out. The IPCC is clear here. Here you see the trajectory in terms of the risk assessments from science from the third assessment of the IPCC all the way till today. What you see here is that the more uh, scientific advances, the lower in global mean temperature is the scientific assessment of the risk of crossing tipping points. And that the tipping point risk today is down between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius with low probability, high impact events. We don't have scientific certainty here yet, but we are seeing more and more a risk landscape that is coming very closer within the Paris range. The scientific frontier here is that we are not only seeing the risk of crossing tipping points, but it's also that we are seeing the risk of interactions, so-called cascades between tipping element systems. And you see here, for example, when the Greenland ice sheet melts fast, releasing cold fresh water in the North Atlantic, slowing down the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, impacting on the monsoon over the Amazon, which can explain higher degree of droughts and forest fires in the Amazon rainforest, which in turn also locks in warm water in the Southern Ocean, accelerating potentially the melting of the West Antarctic ice shelf. These cascades is on the scientific frontier we are still working very hard on this, but it just gives even stronger message to the negotiators here that precaution is important. Climate action must be just, and this justice factor has very dramatic numbers. We know them all, but just to give you the latest statistics, the richest 1% must reduce emissions by a factor 30, while the poorest 50% in the world can actually increase emissions by a factor 3, for the world to stay within the global carbon budget in a fair way. Now, insight six is really on behavioral change. We need to have a transition not only into decarbonization of the energy systems in terms of technologies, but we also need 1.5 degrees Celsius lifestyles. Status quo in consumption patterns and growth will not take us to the Paris range. This is about equity, but it's also about lifestyle change and behavioral change. Insight seven is about economic policy measures. We have so much scientific evidence today that carbon pricing can accelerate the scale of transition. 61 countries in the world have adopted a price on carbon. This is, however, it's only covering 22% of global emissions are covered by a carbon price, and so far the carbon price is not efficient because it's set at a too low level. But the European Union is the first example in the world of a region where the carbon pricing system is starting to work because it's starting to come up to scientific parity in the level of pricing at over 60 euros per ton of carbon dioxide. Nature-based solutions are absolutely fundamental to have a chance of delivering the Paris Agreement. The challenge, though, is to have robust, resilient nature-based solutions and not to fool ourselves in investing in offsetting mechanisms that have already been factored into the climate models that give us a carbon budget. So, you know, the only reason why we have a remaining carbon budget that allows us to reduce emissions, according to what I mentioned earlier, of a net zero world economy by 2050, is that we assume that nature will continue to be a net carbon sink. So we need nature-based solutions, but we cannot use them to slow down the pace of emission reductions from fossil fuel emissions. The ocean is the resilient thermostat of the planet, biologically and physically. We have so much science today showing the threats to the ocean, and we'll come back to that in the discussion here. 
But this is something that will be also a determinant factor and uh, investing in 30 percent targets for marine protected areas, we believe, is one measure to reduce these threats. And finally, number 10 is on the connections between climate impacts and costing that we need to correct the market economic failure in factoring in the true cost of climate damage and that the number one entry point there is really about health that we have today over seven million people per year being prematurely losing their lives because of air pollutants which is one of the the factors that we need to now fully factor into the costing of our uh, risky journey on climate change. So with that, a uh, rapid overview of the report. You have it on your chairs. And um, back to you, Wendy. Thank you, Johan. Thank you for that overview. And absolutely delighted to be welcome, to welcome on stage um, this is Patricia Espinosa, the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. Thank you for joining us. Patricia, would you like to make some remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Wendy. Thank you uh, for also, Johan. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you uh, today. And I want to, to start by thanking uh, Future Earth, the Earth League, and the World Climate Research Program for this new edition of 10 Insights in Climate Science. Um, the rigor and reliability of scientific research are crucial to those involved in combating climate change. We can discuss what actions are appropriate in the face of climate change, but not what facts are acceptable. Whatever our religious beliefs or political learnings, science is the most accurate picture we have of reality. It is our most reliable way to see the world. The pandemic has shown the consequences that the disregard for science under the form of a misguided rejection of the benefits of vaccination can have for people. It is imperative, however, that we share scientific knowledge on climate change in a way that is clear, easy to understand, and relevant to all people. The most recent IPCC report on the physical science basis of climate change is both a cause for concern and a source of hope. Concern because the scientific data reveals that we are not on a path to limit the rise in the average temperature of the planet to no more than 1.5 degrees. Hope because it confirms that it is still possible to achieve this vital goal, provided we take decisive action during the present decade. And this is why this conference, COP26, is so important. And the 10 insights in climate science shared with us today are yet another appeal to our rationality, indeed, to our collective sanity as a species. From the thawing tundra to the vanishing tropical forests, from the relentless accumulation of emissions to the persistent shortcomings of public policy and corporate action, the evidence of the climate crisis is conclusive. We must choose scientific knowledge over self-serving and ultimately deluded views that place private interests above collective well-being. And we must make sure that all people around the world have access to insights such as those presented this morning. I want to, to thank um, the, the uh, scientists that so um, dedicately have been working in also in this very challenging uh, uh, environment and uh, communicating like we all have been doing uh, virtually to, to put this new uh, edition of the 10 insights uh, together. And I, I really uh, personally want to, to thank you for continuing with this effort. Um, I hope that next year we have 
the, uh, uh, the next uh, edition, hopefully with uh, a better picture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Espinosa, and we really appreciate your personal engagement in elevating the science in these processes that are so important. Thank you for joining us. So um, it's time for questions <coughs> now from, from, from you. We, we have three of our scientific experts online, um, Professor Mercedes Bustamante, an ecologist from the University of Brasilia in Brazil, um, Professor Christy Ebay, a professor in health and planetary science from the University of Washington in the US, and Professor Desta mebrato bile from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. So please, if you have questions, please raise your hand and we will, we will take those questions. Yes, please. Um, we have a microphone. Please um, introduce yourself as well. Uh, thank you. I'm Graham Lawton from New Scientist magazine in London. Um, sorry, I missed the first 10 minutes of the press conference, so I wonder if I could ask maybe Professor Rockstrom to tell me of these 10 new insights, which, which are really new. We keep on being told the science is settled on climate change. What, what, what can we learn that we didn't know before from this report? Thank you. Mm. I'll take that yep. straight. No, thanks. Um, thanks, Graham. Well, there are several um, new parts of this report, not necessarily in terms of never having been out there in the public domain, but with a much higher level of, of confidence in terms of the scientific analysis. The most important one in that sense, I think, is that we have, as we've never had before, so much scientific reassurance with regards to the risk of crossing tipping points. The IPCC, for the first time in the sixth assessment, maps out, in particular, the Arctic sea ice, the Greenland ice sheet, the North Atlantic overturning of heat, even biosphere ships in the West Antarctic ice shelf, the five systems that no longer can be, um, you know, assured to remain stable, so that's, that's one. Um, the second is, is really on, on the new age of intensified megafires, and, and I think, um, is it Mercedes who may be coming back on that? I think also the the justice research is now moving into a new domain of just, just previously focusing on per capita rights to being much more sophisticated in the social scientific analysis of how to integrate mitigation and adaptation measures for justice. And then finally, I, I would pick the nature-based solutions part as being not something that is completely new, but also recognizing how we distinguish between robust and resilient nature-based solutions with, that are additive versus uh, greenwashing risks with nature-based solutions. So there are kind of, but you're right that many of these you've, you've probably touched upon before, but they have a deeper analysis. Thanks, Johan. I'm gonna to turn to our experts online and ask if um, Mercedes, perhaps, uh, Desta, Christy, if you'd like to add anything. Um, I see Desta's nodding. Would you like to take the floor? Mm, we don't hear you, Desta. Uh, Andy, this is Chris. I'm happy to jump in for a moment while yes. we wait for the others. All right. Go ahead, Christy. One of the important. Go ahead. Yes. One of the other insights I would add to Johan's list is the deeper understanding that the human health and the ecosystem benefits of mitigation are larger than the cost of mitigation and occur sooner in time than the benefits of mitigation. That the sooner we implement more mitigation activities, we'll see benefits worldwide for human health and for our ecosystems that will more than pay for the cost of the mitigation. Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you, Desta. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think from a justice perspective, what we have seen in recent years is to, to see more and more justice being brought into the, uh, the core policy and planning process from well-being perspective. 
and in terms of promoting just transition. So instead of being an add-on, it is becoming more, more and more mainstream. And this is something which needs to be further strengthened and enhanced. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mercedes, yes, would you like you. to add something? Please go ahead, Mercedes. Yeah, if I may add, I think one important aspect of the 10 insights is the interconnectedness between them. So when we have mega fires inducing for more extreme fire weathers, we increase non-CO2 emissions, we affect the human health, and also we affect part of the nature based solutions that are key for the climate change mitigation and also climate change adaptation. So it's, I think it's important to consider all these key points, not as isolated aspects, but really integrated aspects that can act synergistically, positive, but also negative. So we have to consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. So further questions? Do I see any more hands? Yes, please. Thank you. This is uh, Bernard Petra with the German newspaper Tagesetum. I have a question on, uh, for Johan, but also maybe for Ms. Espinoza, uh, on the 1.5. So if I get this correctly, you say 1.5 is still possible, but we're running out of time. Um, 1.5 means a reduction of 5% emissions every year if we want to have a 50-50 chance, and 10% reduction if we want to have a two-thirds reduction. Now, I was wondering, when will be the time and the point where you say it's not feasible anymore? And I know this is also a political question, not also, I mean, you can always say we can reach it even if we have to reduce by 50%, it's still possible. But is there a time where you would say, and also Ms. Espinoza, where you'd say it's not doable anymore? Thanks. Yeah, let, <clears throat> thank, thanks, Bernard. I mean, I really appreciate this because I want to emphasize that um, I start here by speaking as, as, a, as a biophysical, natural scientist, earth system scientist, and it's in that context it's possible to say that, yes, the 1.5 degree Celsius window is still open. We have no science to suggest that we could not land at 1.5, but it requires, as you say, a massive pace of reduction of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning. We need to keep all the nature carbon sinks intact. We need to phase out all the non-CO2 gases. We need to have a very, very strong effort of keeping all the global commons functioning. But it is natural scientifically, at least from what we know today, still possible to keep away from tipping points that would self-reinforce warming. If you ask me, is this feasible? Is this, is this politically feasible? There is, as you know, um, I would argue today 50% of the scientific community will tell you it's not feasible, and the other half will tell you potentially feasible. Um, I'm, I'm sitting, to be honest, a bit on the fence here, to, to be honest. But so, so it is, that's the big question. Is, is the feasibility, do we still have a feasible chance? And as you know, since uh, India's pledge yesterday, the latest assessment by Malte Manshausen, is that we are potentially having a 1.9 degree Celsius trajectory now. That's, of course, incredibly important that we've just come potentially below the 2 degree Celsius line, but we're still very far away from 1.5. So I, th I think that the feasibility is, is, is very is, is low. And I don't know what you feel on this, Patricia. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's really probably the question, right? Um, uh, we have uh, one instrument that is provided under the Paris Agreement, which are the nationally determined contributions. And we have the science that also uh, can add knowledge about other factors that, that um, are influencing um, a global warming. I would say that um, the, the issue now when we are seeing that our numbers are not uh, what we need and not what we hope um, is um, really um, 
and, and we see the, the scientific data, it's, it, it's making an appeal to the decision makers to take the relevant decisions now as soon as possible, to go away from business as usual, to go away from a perspective of incremental changes, decisions that do, are not really going to take us uh, very far. So this is why this process is so important. And um, I, I really hope, I mean, uh, for me personally, when I, I see this and I'm talking about this, it's really a, a huge responsibility. I just, I just feel that uh, as a decision maker, uh, as a leader, this is telling us really, please take the right decisions now. It is absolutely urgent. Yeah, maybe if we, if we uh, uh, get to, I don't know, 2025, uh, 2026, and we see that we're really not making any progress, then we would need to assess, can we, can we still say that the uh, window is, is open? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Yes, the time is now. We're running out of time. Um, I'd just like to turn to, to the online experts and ask perhaps Desta from a social science perspective. Do you have any comments on, on this question? I, I, thank you, Wendy. I, I think as it, as it was uh, rightly pointed out uh, uh, by Patricia, it is about time to move from the incremental to the transformational uh, path. And uh, we have a lot of opportunity to uh, promote that transformational ch change, particularly when it comes to developing countries where there is a lot of leapfrogging opportunities. So the world need, need to, to, to take this opportunity uh, and, and uh, make sure that developing countries will go in the, into the right track of low carbon climate resilient development paths by utilizing the existing knowledge and technology systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. I realize I should also just emphasize on, on Brandon's question that the, essentially all climate models show that even if we're able to land at 1.5, it will very likely have a period of overshoot. Someone should recognize that just because we pass 1.5, very likely by 2040, according to the IPCC, and perhaps reach 1.6, 1.7, the chances of coming back will be dependent on the resilience of the biophysical systems on the planet if we have phased out our, our own emissions. So that's also something one has to recognize. It's not every tenth of a degree counts. It will be worse for every 10 degrees that increases, but, but if we are able to come to a zero carbon world economy and we can be good stewards of nature, it can help us to kind of buffer gradually back into 1.5 space. So that, that's, the, that's a natural scientific assessment we have today. Thank you. Thank you for all those responses. And speaking of running out of time, we're actually running out of time in this press conference as well. I'd like to thank our online experts for joining us at, uh, in the middle of the night, actually. Um, our colleagues from Brazil and the United States are um, joining us at a, a very unhealthy hour. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you, Patricia, for, for, for joining us as well. I'd like to just show the last slide, which gives you the contact details of our um, press contact, um, if you'd like to hold interviews, and if you'd like to get hold of graphics and animations that we have related to this report. So um, please contact us for, for uh, please contact Maya, if you'd like to have an interview. Thank you very much, and we look forward to launching the report again next year with the, the, the latest science um, as we're doing every year. Thank you for joining us.